You can be invincible if you never enter a contest in which victory is not under your control. Beware lest, when you see some person preferred to you in honor, or possessing great power, or otherwise enjoying high repute, you are ever carried away by the external impression and deem him happy. For if the true nature of the good is one of the things that are under our control, there is no place for either envy or jealousy, and you yourself will not wish to be a praetor or a senator or a consul, but a free man. Now there is but one way that leads to this, and that is to despise the things that are not under our control. Chapter 19 begins with this observation by Epictetus about what it would require for us to be invincible, that is, unconquerable, or in the Greek, uh, niketos. Nike means victory. And one of the um, common drives that we have as human beings is what the Greeks called philonikia, meaning the desire to, to win, the desire to beat out the others in competition. It often turns into a desire to be right, to have others acknowledge that is the case. And so all of this is, is tied up in this conception of being invincible. Really, the invincibility that we should be most concerned with has to do with ourself and our judgment about ourself, a, a realistic judgment, not an inflated judgment that we're something that we're not, not a narcissistic judgment, also not a depressive or you know um, self-destructive judgment that, that says that we're worse off than we are. So what does it take to be unconquerable? So one way to do this, and this is, can be understood in multiple ways, he says you can be invincible if you never enter a contest in which victory is not under your control. And so when you hear that at first, it might be tempting to believe that the Stoic is saying, all right, withdraw from life altogether, never take any risks, just maintain yourself in as, as you know, controlled and as invulnerable a posture as you possibly can. Don't let anybody hurt. And here we can think about what, what might get hurt. Don't let anybody hurt your body, right? Don't place yourself in risky situations, which is a good idea. Prudence dictates that anyway. But your body is not really what he's talking about. In, in other places, Epictetus will acknowledge that when it comes to disease, when it comes to the things that other people might do to our body, when it comes to famine and hunger, even when it comes to bodily death, these are things that largely lie outside of our control. If they lie in anybody's control, they lie in somebody else's control. It's their thoughts, their decisions, their actions that decide that we're going to get hurt. Epictetus, when he was a slave, um, he, he was lamed by his owner, so the story goes. And the owner was messing around with his leg. And Epictetus said, if you keep pushing it, you're going to ruin it. And the, the owner did that and ended up making him lame as a result. That's a perfect example of something where it's impossible for us to make ourselves invincible. We can't make ourselves bodily invincible, nor can we do so when it comes to our possessions. We can you know, invest in security. We can uh, make sure that we know the local police. We can be part of the neighborhood watch. We can find out who the local criminals are and buy them off. We, we can do all sorts of things. We could even, you know, worry about uh, the government taxing us. And so we try to hide our wealth. None of that really provides us with the kind of invincibility, the, the, in, the, the state of not being able to be conquered or bested that he's talking about here. So what else? We could talk about our reputations there. It's something even more ephemeral. Uh, our online presence, uh, all it takes, you know, is somebody to hack into your account, post a few things that are offensive, and everything that you've got could be destroyed in an instant. Or, I mean, you could do that yourself, you know, <laughs> without the hacking. Or uh, somebody parodies you and suddenly everybody's laughing at you, right? All these things are ways in which we are the opposite of invincible. So what does it mean then 
to only enter a contest where victory is under our control. It means that when we're engaged in some sort of contest about what matters, it should be with ourselves. It should be over whether we can discipline ourselves, whether we can reorient our choices so that we, in fact, pursue the right things, so that we use the appearances that we have rightly, so that we use our bodies rightly, so that we use our relationships rightly or approach our relationships rightly, so that we fulfill our roles and duties and obligations the way that justice requires us to do, so that we build the virtues within ourselves and gradually rip out or extirpate, and that's what extirpate really means, the vices within ourselves so that we move from cowardice to courage. We move from folly to wisdom. We move from injustice or unfairness or greed or whatever other modality of it you want to justice. And that we move from a lack of self-control over bodily desires and appetites to the state that, that the ancients called temperance or moderation. All of that is a victory. All of that is something where we can be defeated. But the only thing that can really defeat us isn't those things on the outside. If you act intemperately and you eat the third helping at dinner and then have dessert after that, it wasn't the food that made you do that. The food, you know, presented itself as an appearance to you saying, mmm, you're going to love this. Come on over here and get it. But you and your desires directed yourself that way. And you could have resisted if you had, you know, some stoic dogmata ready at hand and you decided, I want to think this decision out in terms of my larger goal of having my faculty of choice in accordance with nature, in, in terms of developing and deploying the virtues. So all of that is just commentary on, on the first sentence. Let's go on and look at the examples that he has. These are examples that were, were common in Epictetus' time and culture. They're very common in ancient cultures all across the board, cross, you know, cross civil, civilizationally. And they are just as common in our own time, probably because they're part of the human condition that we're going to see over and over again. So he says, beware uh, so that when you see some person preferred to you in honor or possessing great power or otherwise enjoying high repute, uh, you are ever carried away by the external impression and deem him happy. Watch out because otherwise this is sort of an automatic process. Our culture pushes this onto us. We actually have like a whole culture industry, as it's been called for now decades, that um, you know tells us these people are happy, these people are fortunate, these people are, we don't use the word blessed, although a few of them do every once in a while, uh, but that's, that's the, the, the tenor of it. So we see people on, on television shows uh, and we say, oh my gosh, what a great life they're having. We forget that it's been so edited that we're only seeing this tiny little portion. And we can't see inside of the person, even if they do, like in reality shows, go into the booth and talk into the camera like I'm, I'm doing to you today, right? Although this isn't a booth, this is my, my classroom. Um, we have to watch out. Otherwise, our natural tendencies, given our culture, and this is not nature in the way that we want it to be, the realized nature, nature rather in the sense of just how things tend to pan out, our tendencies are to mistakenly assume that these people are happy. Why are they happy? Well, like you said, somebody who is being preferred to you in honor. Uh, the Greek for that is pro timoremenon, right? Uh, or somebody who has a lot of power, um, somebody who is mega dunamenon. Uh, or uh, somebody who is um, enjoying high repute. Eudoki Munta, right? And he says, don't believe that these people are actually happy, although the Greek term there is makaries, which means blessed. It's a state beyond mere eudaimonia in a lot of philosophers, and it means to like be enjoying everything, bliss. 
This is something that a lot of people think, and this is what we see, you know, leading people on. If I could just get that next rung in the hierarchy, I'm going to be so happy. If I could just, you know, have a YouTube channel with a hundred thousand viewers instead of, you know, a thousand viewers, then I'll be somebody. This is how we often say it. I'll be somebody. If I could just have a hit single, right? If I could just have that big house, like uh, the person who I admire has, if I could just have the spending power that they do, if I could eat in the kinds of restaurants that they do, if I could have the kind of uh, girlfriend or boyfriend or spouse that the, it seems like the beautiful people have. And we could go on and on and on and on. So what, what are we supposed to do? He says, don't get carried away by the external impression. We have flooding towards us all the time, appearances, fantasia, and they tell us stories about how happy those people are, about how wonderful it is to enjoy these external goods. So he says, um, if the true nature of the good is one of the things that are, are under our control, then there is no place for either envy or jealousy. And the, the terms that he's translating there are thonos, envy, and zelotupia, uh, for, for jealousy. And <clears throat> a little bit more about this. Zelos can also mean something like emulation. You know, when you see somebody, for example, um, let's say you're a musician and you go to uh, a show and you see somebody. A great example for myself, I've seen Bella Fleck play. Bella Fleck is an amazing banjo player and he's not just able to do, you know, bluegrassy kind of traditional banjo stuff. He plays the entire gamut. He can play classical music. He can play rock and roll. He can play, you know, whatever you want. Uh, he is a virtuoso. And I've gone to see him at the show and I felt that, that pang, that, that sort of desire to, to be like him. I play banjo, but, you know, at a very low level, <laughs> nothing remotely like what, what he can do. And, Aristotle, for example, says zealous is a good thing. It drives us to try to be better. It's a sign of good character. But it can easily turn into something that, um, you know, makes us feel bad, that, uh, you know, drives us in, in certain ways. And we want to be free of that, according to Epictetus and the Stoics. So he says, if the, the you know, what's really good for us is what's in our control, what's within us, then when you see the rich, famous person who's also, uh, you know, just killing it, as we say, right, uh, in so many different ways, um, are they actually enjoying that? Well, you don't really know. Um, the things that they are enjoying aren't the sorts of goods that we ought to be jealous or envious of. It doesn't really make sense from a Stoic perspective. They're not even really goods from a Stoic perspective. But even if you assume that they are, because, you know, we often fall into those, those uh, assumptions, it's not something that we should begrudge another. So if somebody else gets the position, you know, then should I say, uh, oh, I should have gotten that position. I should be in that role. No, it's, it worked out that way. There's nothing for me to be envious of in, in that case. So he goes on and he says, you yourself will not wish, if you confine yourself to what's under your control, to be a praetor or a senator or a consul. These are all sort of like high titles, like being president. Uh, we might think of being, you know, the CEO or, you know, even lower level, the office manager, right? Um, if you're focused on what is within your control and you're finding your good there, you're not going to be upset by the fact that you're not getting promoted the way that you think that you ought to or, or other people whispering in your ear think that, that you ought to. Uh, instead, you will want to be a free person. That will be the focus. And eleutheros, this, uh, this is translated sometimes as a free person, sometimes as a liberal person. It means a person who actually gets to decide for him or herself. And he goes on and he says, now there is but one way that leads to this. And that is to despise the things that are not under our control. Despise doesn't mean to hate. The Greek term for it here is kataphronein, which means literally to, to look down upon. 
So it's not to look down upon by tilting your head back like this. It's to realize that those things really that are not under your control, like uh, you know, power, prestige, position, celebrity, uh, lots of money in the bank, all, all these these sorts of matters, they're not under your control, and you you don't have to say, oh, I hate them. That would really just be being you know enthralled to them as well. You say they they aren't that important. They don't matter that much. That's what it is to look down upon them, or as he's saying here, to despise them. Bear in mind that it is not the man who reviles or strikes you that insults you, but it is your judgment that these men are insulting you. Therefore, when someone irritates you, be assured that it is your own opinion which has irritated you. And so make it your first endeavor not to be carried away by the external impression. For if once you gain time and delay, you will more easily become master of yourself. Chapter 20 is providing us with a, you might say, very basic point in Stoic psychology and in Stoic ethics. He says, bear in mind... Remember, literally, that it is not the man who reviles or strikes you that insults you, but it is your judgment that these men are insulting you. So what, what is he saying there? This is well worth lingering over. Um, so to begin with, the, the Greek term that's you know stri uh, reviling you or striking you, uh, loideron, uh, to speak in an abusive way to somebody else, you know, hey, jerk, you know, I'm not going to actually swear on this in the, in the commentary thing, but you could supply whatever you want, um, telling jokes about you, picking on you, all these, these sorts of things. Criticizing you unfairly would be an example of that. Um, striking you, tube tone, that, that just literally means to whack somebody, right? Um, and now the term that he's using here for insult is hubridzein. And this, this is a, a term that has a lot of resonance in, in Greek. It can mean insulting. It can mean doing, you know, wanton uh, injury to somebody. It has a wide spectrum. And we feel ourselves um, oppressed in this way an awful lot, sometimes by people who didn't even mean to do it. Um, sometimes, and this, you know, is going to strike us as kind of crazy when we put it this way, uh, by people who are half the world around from us and have never met us and probably never will meet us, but who we see on a video or we uh, read, you know, the, the column that they wrote uh, in, I don't know, the New York Times or the London Times or the Bangladeshi Times, whatever it happens to be. And we think that somehow we are being offended. That would be another way to translate um, hubridzen, not, not so much with the connotation of the, the you know, state of feeling offense, but somebody deliberately trying to offend you. So we are in an environment where this is a particularly big risk, not, not you know, only because we have the, the, the internet as an uh, integral part of our environment, but um, in large part because of that, but also because of the fact that we interact personally and talk about the Internet so much as well. You could say the Internet is flooded over into our culture and it's very difficult to get away from it. So what that's done is opened up a greater exposure for most people to being um, in situations where they're confronted with uh, other people saying things, doing things that, that seem like they have to do with, with us. Um, if somebody, for example, starts you know, ranting about white privilege, um, well, I'm white, so probably that has to do with me. Even though that person has never met me, um, has no idea about what my circumstances are, um, you know, it's not directed at me, but I can take it as personal. Um, somebody cuts me off in traffic, another prosaic example as well. This is a great, you know, great example for our modern times. Uh, whether you bike, whether you uh, drive a car, whether you take public transportation, there's always somebody in your way. And there's always somebody who's working at cross purposes to you, isn't there? And so it, it's easy to um, see what they're doing as somehow offending you. 
if somebody talks, you know, in a disparaging way about something that you care about, it's hard not to take that personally. And Epictetus says, look, remember that what's going on is not that they're actually insulting you, not even, even though they may in fact be trying to insult you, but um, what's really going on is your judgment. Your judgment is playing a major role in deciding what's going on. Your judgment that these people are insulting you is what is a central cause. If you can eliminate that judgment, they can do whatever the hell they want, and it's got nothing to do with you. Or, you know, if, if you're an object of the sentence, that guy over there, Dr. Sadler's a jerk. He, you know, I don't like the way he teaches philosophy. I get, I get comments like this all the time. Uh, fortunately, I get a lot better uh, comments more of the time. But sometimes, you know, he talks too fast. He talks too slow. You, know, you can't please everybody, right? Um, if, I, if I judge that I am being insulted by that person, then I am insulted by that person. If I don't engage in that judgment, then I am free from that. And what is the, the judgment here? A dogma, uh, you know, what we translate uh, as a judgment, <clears throat> but we can also translate as an opinion. We can translate as something that we say to ourselves or something that we believe, the, the sense of dogma. So if I, if I have in the back of my head all these dogmata, that's the plural for dogma, kind of floating around, just you know, waiting to be attached to things, I'm probably going to be a miserable person when I go out into traffic or when I read through the comment section on any given video. So he says, um, when someone irritates you, be assured that it's your own opinion which has irritated you. That's not to say that they might not have had the intention of trying to irritate you. Sometimes people really, you know, do go around and try to hurt each other, try to provoke a reaction for various, you know, some people try to do that just to make a lot of money because they know that what we call clickbait, the best motivator is actually anger. And you get angry when you feel like somebody has insulted or outraged you. Somebody has committed hubris, right? And he says, but it, it's your opinion that has actually irritated you. So, and, and here he uses the term hupolepsis. Your assumption would be another way of translating it. So he goes on and he says, make it your first endeavor not to be carried away by your external impression, by the appearance. Don't let it grab onto you and pull you around. That's what the, the um, being carried away is. Soon arpas thesenai, right? Which harp, you know, heart pain to grab onto. Soon, you sort of like it's grabbing all around you and pulling you in, right? So don't allow your, your uh, opinion to do that to you. Don't allow the appearances to sweep over you and dominate you. And he says, if once you gain time and delay, you will more easily become master of yourself. So here's a very useful bit of advice. We're confronted with appearances. Somebody is in a bar and they're, you know, they slosh their drink on you and then they turn around and they say, hey, jerk off, you know, look what you did. You made me spill my drink. Uh, what, what's wrong with you, right? You can react right away, in which case your reaction is probably going to be something like, hey, you're the jerk off, buddy. Or, you know, let's say you're, you're adopting the stoic thing and you kick in right away. Hey, I don't want any trouble, buddy, you know. Um, or you could just pause. You don't have to respond to everything immediately. This is another one of the dangers that we, we often feel. Uh, you know, we, we feel that we have to respond to things immediately or we're not taking charge of the situation. We're becoming passive. Things are just happening to us. Um, the people will keep on doing the same thing to us. And that's not necessarily the case. That, that right, right there is a dogma. That is a judgment. That is something that we're, we're bringing to the situation. Instead, we can give ourselves a little bit of a pause, and then we can see whether the appearance really is the way it's presenting itself, or whether we're projecting things into the situation. Assumptions, hupolepsis, or uh, judgments, opinions, dogmata. Uh, and if we're doing that, and we notice ourselves doing that, we can pull those back. 
we can say, I don't need to assume this. Now, we probably don't need to go into this whole process explicitly with the person who seems to be insulting us because that would, you know, confuse them or provoke them. Uh, we can do this on our own. And by doing so, we will free ourselves up in some very significant ways.